Hello, everyone. This is the Asian American Herald, a new media network that airs via live stream on Facebook and YouTube twice a week. I'm Hamani Gupta Carlson, host of the Thursday Evening Show. So I would like to open our show tonight with a weekly tribute to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, who are the original caretakers of much of upstate New York, where the Asian American Herald is based. And in making this tribute, I would like to acknowledge myself as a settler, and I would like to thank the Haudenosaunee for providing me shelter. Last month, a gunman opened fire at a FedEx facility at the Indianapolis International Airport. Nine people were killed, including the shooter who turned his weapon on himself, and seven others were injured. The mass shooting is one of 194 such incidents that have occurred in the U.S. this year as of May 10th. In Indianapolis, four of the nine people killed were South Asian Americans. They were followers of the Sikh faith. These deaths came just a month after shootings at a spa in Atlanta left eight people dead, six of who were Korean American. So the shootings in Indianapolis hit particularly hard for me because Indiana happens to be my childhood home. On a broader scale, however, the, re the shootings reveal what cultural critic Jeff Chang has described as a hidden America, kind of a space where racist behaviors and practices are continually reinstalled, um, often under, uh, without kind of a lot of notice from everyone else. So tonight, what I'd like to do is probe this hidden America a little bit further. I've invited two guests who live and work in Indiana. Dr. Kunwar J. Bugga, or simply J, is a professor of computer science at Ball State University in Muncie. He and his wife have lived in Indiana since the 1970s and have raised a son and daughter to adult age. And they now also have three grandchildren, two of who live with their parents in Bloomington, Indiana, and the other with his parents in Louisville, Kentucky, which is just over the state border. And my other guest is Dr. Melissa Borja, who has been on our show a couple of times in the past. She is a professor of Asian American studies at the University of Michigan, and she resides in Indianapolis with her husband and her teenage daughter. While uh, Dr. Borja is a relative newcomer to the state, she has been active in numerous events aimed at raising awareness of Asian Americans. And I should also note that both um, Jay and Melissa are good friends of mine. So with that said, I would like to welcome you both to our show. So glad to be here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So I'd actually like to start by asking you both if you could share with our listeners and viewers how you came to reside in Indiana. Where did you grow up and what were the circumstances that brought you to the Hoosier State? So Jay, would you like to begin? Well, thank you, Himani. Uh, let me begin by thanking you to, to invite me to come to your show and share some ideas uh, and comments. Uh, and so thank you. It's happy to be here. And it's nice to also meet Melissa on the show. Uh, so I grew up in Mumbai, Indiana, which, as you know, or many of the listeners would know, is a huge metropolis, uh, not unlike New York. Uh, the population of Mumbai, uh, when I last looked, is uh, way beyond 10 million. Uh, it's a very diverse and a cosmopolitan city, Mumbai. And uh, the population in Mumbai represents almost all the linguistic and ethnic communities in India, as well as many other parts of the world. So I grew up in that environment, being very aware of the international events and uh, events in India and uh, other parts of the world. Uh, of course, after I completed my college in, in Mumbai, I, I wanted to uh, do graduate work. So I applied to universities in US and uh, I was accepted at uh, Purdue University and some other universities and I ended up picking Purdue and I'm glad I did. Uh, Purdue University is based in West Lafayette, Indiana. So uh, came to uh, Purdue in the mid 70s and uh, we've lived uh, our family uh, in Indiana since then. 
uh, our kids uh, went to school uh, up in Fort Wayne, where we lived for a few years in the early 80s after I graduated from Purdue. And then we moved to Muncie in late 80s, which is where we've lived since then. Our kids then also went to universities within Indiana, to IU and Purdue. And now they are both uh, settled, uh, married, and as you mentioned, Himani, they live not too far uh, away from uh, Muncie, uh, uh, those cities being Bloomington, uh, Indiana, and Louisville, just across the river. For us, growing up in Indiana has been a very pleasant experience and a very nice. Uh, we have found uh, that uh, Indiana is a friendly place and the towns and cities we lived in. And we have since enjoyed living here. Thank you. Thank you. And Melissa, um, would you like to share your story of what brought you to Indiana? Yeah, so I am a native Midwesterner. My parents are from the Philippines, but I was born and raised in Saginaw, Michigan, and loved growing up in Michigan. But I went to a lot of different places while I was going to school and while I was in graduate school and my husband was in training. So I lived in a lot of other places that were pretty different from Saginaw, Michigan. Lived in Boston, Massachusetts, Chicago. I lived in New York City for 10 years, in Davis, California. To be perfectly honest, I had no idea I would ever live in Indiana. Um, and it, currently, I, I don't even work in Indiana. I, I work at the University of Michigan. Um, but when my husband was looking for a job, uh, he considered a job at Indiana University School of Medicine. And so that's what brought us here. Now, we had four other options. They were very different, Kentucky, Colorado, California. We chose Indiana in part because I had visited Indianapolis for some religious studies conferences and actually fell in love with the city. I came home for my first trip to Indianapolis and I said, did you know that Indianapolis is a really cool place to be? <laughs> and all my friends in New York City thought I was really lying. They thought I was dishonest. I said, no, really, it's a really wonderful place to be. And so one reason why we ended up in Indiana is because of those trips and I just fell in love with the city. So um, we are here, we've been here since the fall of 2019 and uh, I love living here so much. I love being a Hoosier. That's awesome and that's really awesome to hear. And I have to say, having been to your apartment in downtown Indianapolis once, you, um, your entire living setting makes Indianapolis a very cool place to be. <laughs> I live in the most New York part of Indianapolis, and so maybe yeah. that has something to do with it. Yeah. Oh, well, it's it's very nice. Um, but, you know, I had a sense that even before these shootings occurred at the Indianapolis airport on April 15th, that the anti-Asian climate was getting more tense, at least in Indianapolis in the city. And that was due in part to some posts I saw you were making via Facebook regarding um, the anti-Asian American and Pacific Islander hate. And so I was wondering if you could just tell us about anti-AAPI hate in Indiana and, you know, some of the work you've been doing to raise awareness and combat that, um, you know, through the Indiana chapter of National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum and elsewhere. Yes. Um, so I am, have been leading a research team based at the University of Michigan since March 2020 studying anti-Asian racism during COVID. And I began this project because I heard so many stories of people I know and love all across the country experiencing racism while they were going shopping, walking down the street, going to school. So I've been using news media to track incidents of anti-Asian racism. And early in the pandemic, I heard stories of Asian Americans experiencing racism here in Indiana. A Korean American doctor, for example, denied the opportunity to pump gas at a gas station in Martinsville, or a Hmong family denied the opportunity to use a motel um, in the northern part of the state. So my team actually just released a report on Monday, and you can see online, we, we looked at all the hate incidents reported in the news in 2020 and found that when you look at the number of hate incidents and normalize it to the population, the Asian American population in a particular state, there are more anti-Asian racist incidents 
per capita AAPI in Indiana than there are in California. Even though California gets a lot of attention, it's just we are more vulnerable. We're a smaller population, so the number of incidents that have taken place here um, have been pretty high compared to the number of people who actually live here who are Asian American. So the organization I'm part of, National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, we were paying attention to these stories. We were hearing how people were concerned, and we actually created a petition urging Governor Holcomb to condemn anti-Asian racism, to take positive action to make it a safe, inclusive community, and also to establish a state advisory commission to serve Asian Americans. One exists for Latinos, one exists for other groups, um, and the state of Michigan also has a state advisory commission for Asian Americans. So other states have state commissions for Asian Americans, but we don't have one in Indiana. And so um, we created this petition specifically to ask the governor to do these three things, to take positive actions, to make sure that Asian Americans uh, here in Indiana are able to, to not be afraid to go about their daily lives. That's awesome. You know, I circulated that petition and I actually specifically put it on my high school senior class Facebook page. And there are very few. There are like, I might be the only Asian American who graduated in the class of 81 um, from the now defunct, no longer existing Muncie Northside High School. But um, I was actually amazed at how many people signed that petition. So I was, I was quite pleased to see that. Um, what is the status of it now? Have you submitted it to the governor yet? We delivered it to the governor on the one year anniversary of the declaration of COVID being a global pandemic. One thing that we feel really great about is we had so many signatories. We had lots of people sign as individuals and some major institutional endorsements. For example, Indiana University as an institution endorsed it. Butler University, um, Faith in Indiana, um, ma major faith-based organizations like the um, Indiana Muslim Advocacy Network. Uh, but Governor Holcomb hasn't really moved forward. And when we brought the petition to him and asked him, what do you think? All he said was, uh, racism is wrong. And so it's pretty disappointing that Governor Holcomb didn't even say the word Asian Americans. And it was really disappointing in that I could see us being invisibilized right there. They're refusing even to say the word Asian Americans. And, and as far as I know, he has not said anything about Asian Americans experiencing racism during the pandemic. And that I think is an area for improvement. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably a good way of putting it mildly. <laughs> um, so Jay, um, what is your sense of kind of all this um, and maybe taking it away from the um, Indianapolis context and placing it more in a Muncie context, as Muncie is a bit of a smaller community than Indianapolis. Um, what's your sense of ra the racial politics locally? And you know, what's been changing over the years? Uh, yes, Imani. Uh, so in, in general, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we moved from you know West Lafayette and then to Fort Wayne and then to Muncie, and of course, Muncie is a much smaller town than Fort Wayne, uh, that being, I think, the second largest city after Indianapolis in Indiana. Yeah. Uh, we, our interaction with, uh, with both the Asian communities and locals, of course, has been very open. Uh, fortunately, you know, we, uh, uh, my workplace has been the universities all along, and, you know, universities are open, uh, welcoming places with quite a bit of diverse population also. And both, uh, of course, Purdue has a very large international student population. So there's quite a bit of awareness in that area, uh, in the Lafayette, West Lafayette area. And Fort Wayne also has a large Asian population. Uh, so our in our interactions with both the local community and in other communities, we found uh, ourselves to be quite welcome we we never had any any uh, experiences which we would call unpleasant in terms of interacting within the work environment or within the city uh, our children grew up in fort wayne uh, they went to elementary school and middle school and then they went to uh, middle school and high school in muncie uh, before graduating and then moving to universities within indiana 
And uh, as far as we can recall, we never had any incident with our children or other Asian children that they that they interacted with or with the local uh, kids. Uh, so overall, this has been uh, pleasant. Uh, no, no uh, overt uh, unpleasantness. But of course, there are news that we follow. I've not been very active in the political aspects of it, but I've been quite active in the community and social aspects. So in, in Mansi, we, as Himani, you may know, we have had a organization of South Asians in Mansi. And that right. uh, community has been very active in interacting with the local community. Uh, we have attended their events, the events here. We've been to UU Church and quite a few other places. And of course, we have invited the locals to be part of our events to raise the awareness. And the South Asian Community Association is largely Indians. Of course, there are other uh, countries from South Asia that have been part of this. So uh, by and large, this has been a positive experience. We found the communities to be welcoming in spite of what we've heard. Let me also mention that in all these years that we've been here since the mid 70s, uh, the, the, what has changed, I think, is a heightened awareness of Asian Americans in Indiana. When we first came to Purdue uh, in the mid 70s, uh, of course, on campus, there was a large population, but then we didn't find a lot of Asians and Sikhs and Indians in particular in the community. But we found a smaller community in Indianapolis. There is a there was one uh, Gurudwara which was held at an Indian association location back even in the mid 70s. And those were early days for us. And that was a very small community. But there was uh, a good uh, awareness of that community in the events uh, in Indianapolis. So we got to know that community quite a bit. Of course, it was a bit of a drive for me as a student to go to Indianapolis, uh, about a couple hours where it was. But then we saw a growth in the Asian and Sikh community in Fort Wayne and uh, uh, not so much in Muncie. In Muncie, there have been very few Sikh families. So, so our uh, interaction with Sikh community has been either in Fort Wayne or in Indianapolis. So overall, a pleasant experience, I would say. Yeah. So, you know, against that pleasant, pleasant experience, um, we had this tragic event, these yes. shootings at the FedEx facility. And I'm wondering if you could speak a bit to how it affected the Sikh community and if it did kind of raise more public awareness of the community and some of the issues it might face. Uh, yes, uh, Himani. So the, of course, the FedEx uh, shooting uh, event came as a big shock to the Sikh community, not only in Indianapolis and in the surrounding regions, but also all over the country and all over the world. I mean, this uh, spread like uh, uh, in the media, like why? Uh, there is a large Sikh community in Indianapolis and th there's been a, an almost an exponential growth in the number of Sikh families in Indianapolis. And they now number, if you add the Sikh community families in Indianapolis and in the surrounding re regions, it's several thousand families now. That, mm -hmm. And there was a big uh, uh, influx, if I might call it, from California. Many Sikh families moved uh, from California about a decade ago to the southern part of Indianapolis, the Greenwood. Uh, in fact, that's where the FedEx location is near the airport. So quite a few Sikh families. So overnight, uh, you know, those, uh, like you said, you were about the only Asian student in, the, in your graduating class. There were some schools that suddenly the complexion changed from all locals to quite a bit of Sikh and Asian uh, children in the school. So that, that helped raise the awareness quite a bit, I think. And, and then, of course, this uh, event, the, the FedEx event, is not the first one. Uh, there were Sikhs uh, who were uh, uh, attacked and some were killed uh, after the 9-11, and that's well known. And, but then there was another uh, shooting attack in, in, in Wisconsin at a Gurudwara, which is the Sikh place of worship back in 2012. That event uh, was a major event. I think six uh, 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 worshippers, six, uh, six were killed 
And, and that raised the awareness quite a bit in terms of why Sikhs were targeted in their holy place, in their place of worship. And, and that's been well researched and there's been reasons. What has recently happened in, in Indianapolis with the FedEx shooting, uh, from what news I have followed and from what we know, we really don't know the cause of this, whether it was directed at <clears throat> Sikhs in particular or Asian communities or whether it was an act of violence on part of an individual uh, because others were killed too. So that's something <clears throat> that still remains to be found. But I think the heightened awareness of uh, <clears throat> Sikhs and Asians because of these events uh, in the long run is going to be helpful to us. The raised profile should be helpful. More uh, <clears throat> locals are now aware of what Sikhs represent, what their values are, uh, what kind of peace loving community they are. And I think that's overall in the long run going, is going to be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Well, good to hear. Melissa, did you want to add um, to kind of the, um, the uh, Jay's thoughts on, on this event? Well, I would add that after Atlanta, the Atlanta shootings happened, yeah. literally one of my NAPOF colleagues here in Indiana said, I hope this never happens in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And then almost exactly a month later, it did. But what was striking to me is that I think the reception of the event was different. I think people were talking about Atlanta a lot and it was distressing to me, honestly, to see less attention to this shooting at the FedEx that disproportionately impacted um, Sikh Americans who are Asian Americans, um, to see that being treated differently in the public conversation. I don't really know what's going on, um, but I'm troubled by it. It also occurred to us because a lot of us in NAPOF are based in Indianapolis, um, that that shooting really made clear to me that it would have been so useful to already have a state advisory commission on Asian Americans in place. It would have been already useful to have government officials know what our communities need. And I think they did the best they could. There were public events where elected officials showed up. But if we had had institutions in place, I think that it would have been a better response, a more effective support for people who were really hurt and grieving at that time. So if anything, that event made clear to me that the things we're asking for in our petition would be useful to Asian American Hoosiers. Yeah. You know what? I had <clears throat> read somewhere in the news, kind of in the news media that I was following that, you know, there was that question of whether um, it was an intentional targeting of Sikhs or whether it was, um, you know, it was not a racial or whether or not it was a racialized event. But I remember uh, reading something in the news coverage that something like 90% of the workforce Mm -hmm. it, at that FedEx facility is Sikh. So if you're going to go in there uh, with a weapon and open fire, it's, you know, you're targeting Sikhs. And I just wonder, you know, either of you maybe could jump in for a second or so and just give me your thoughts on that. So the only other connection that I remember also reading in the media reports that the, the shooter worked at that location and had left that location. So, so that raises questions as to what uh, his motives may have been to return to that uh, place where he was an employee. I would add also that the Indianapolis uh, Metropolitan Police Department did report that they knew that the shooter had been looking at white supremacist websites when they were investigating his situation last year. And so for that reason, both Latin, uh, national and local uh, groups have been calling for this incident to be investigated fully as a hate crime. Um, so we know that in Indiana, there are a lot of white supremacist groups and it is showing up in a lot of different ways. We can see, for example, uh, what's been going on with the farmer's market in Bloomington. So I think, I think this is a moment when we have to say, you know, we're really nice 
A lot of uh, Hoosiers are very friendly and kind to one another, but there are also some dark elements here in our state. And we need to be truthful about how some people might be more vulnerable because of the presence of those organizations and those communities that are, are out to do harm to, um, to Asian Americans and other people of color. Yeah. So, you know, earlier I referenced Jeff Chang. He, um, he's, I guess, a hip hop scholar, for lack of a better word. He writes about the intersections of hip hop community activism and race. And he's done a number of books. The one I'm actually um, reading, um, actually listening to since I spend a lot of time in my car, I listen to books a lot. Uh, but the one I'm looking at now is called We Gonna Be All Right. And in this book, um, he offers a really extensive analysis of the 2014 shooting of Michael Brown by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. And he also sort of talks about the how the spontaneous protests and organizing that kind of sprung up around that really gave momentum to the Black Lives Matter movement, which was at that point, just a very fledgling group uh, created by um, three women um, out of California. And in part of that analysis, he really, um, he sketches a really interesting demographic and geographic uh, profile of Ferguson and the greater St. Louis area. And he talks about how Blacks in the 1990s began to be pushed out of cities and into poorer suburbs, um, sort of after whites fled um, the cities for the suburbs, they started to come back into the cities and in doing so pushed the Blacks out into these other areas. And he suggested that what we were seeing in St. Louis and its suburb Ferguson was um, a replica of what was going on in some of the other great old industrial cities of the Midwest, St. Louis, Cleveland, Detroit. And that how these shifts have occurred have actually effectively allowed police and other authorities to get away with using brute force to keep Blacks in other non-white communities in their place. And, you know, all of that made me think a bit about Indianapolis. Um, it obviously always makes me think about Muncie. Anytime I think of the Midwest, any reference to the Midwest, I think about Muncie. And it also made me think a bit about Gary, Indiana. And I was wondering, um, Melissa, if you could actually just talk about this a little bit. Um, what happens in Indianapolis from your perspective when uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, BIPOC folk are perceived as whites for not knowing their place? Well, I think what happens is that uh, all of these communities see their futures and their liberation as intertwined. Um, and I, I think we are increasingly having, at all levels of our society, the national level, the global level, the state level, and the very local level, a very frank conversation about how racism is a pervasive problem, a systemic problem, um, that it affects a wide variety of people, it affects different communities in different ways, but it is um, an enduring problem. White supremacy is an enduring problem. So one thing that I, I think is important to lift up, and I think Jeff Chang and his work right now with the May 19th project, which just launched yesterday, it's all about solidarity. I think if we um, think about the theme of what happens when um, white people try to put other groups in their place is that the communities that are marginalized realize they have to work together. Um, and we've seen that in really powerful ways. So just to give one local example, when NAPA started our petition, the first groups to come to our support were Muslim groups, they were local black leaders, they were um, Latino organizations, there was a shared sense of how um, our liberation, once again, is tied up in the liberation and the well-being, the safety and inclusion of other people. Um, and I think that we feel that more acutely in a place like Indianapolis, where the populations are still relatively small um, compared to other states. Uh, so we have to work together 
in order for us to get anything done. Yeah, I think that was something my parents um, realized at an early, kind of early on. They came, you know, to in, they came to Indiana when the population was very, very, very small, and they were like, "If we were going to build a life here, we have to reach out and learn, you know, and be with others." Um, Jay, as you know, um, in my book uh, Muncie, Indiana, I actually um, talk a fair amount about the coalitions that have formed between um, the Indian and South Asian community, uh, the black community, the Jewish community, and often these coalitions and alliances have formed around um, faith. Um, and so there have been interfaith celebrations of the National Day of Prayer and whatnot, but they've also kind of really worked at doing some racial, some healing from the racial um, trauma that Muncie experienced during the eras of segregation and kind of the desegregation period. So I'm wondering if you had any thoughts about, um, you know, what, what people need to do um, in terms of working together to move forward. Uh, certainly, Himani, I, I would agree with you that there's been a, a lot of good work and effort in, in Muncie, especially uh, with these interfaith organizations. After 9-11, there was a resurgence of such <clears throat> interfaith groups and which involved local communities too, in particular Sikhs in Indianapolis and in other parts of India, uh, Indiana. You know, they are well known to be a volunteer organization or a community which is always ready to help. Uh, they've been generous in their support of uh, people in need of help. Uh, yes. And I think that raises the profile, not just for Sikhs, but for Asians, uh, by raising the awareness further. Uh, so I think that the solution is, along the lines you proposed, is all these communities work together. Uh, interfaith, but also involve the locals or the other uh, the, the communities overall to 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 work together in trying to uh, to uh, I wouldn't say educate, but to to make uh, people more aware of what values the Asians represent and what kind of communities they are. Yeah. Okay. Well, well done. I actually. Did want to note the generosity of uh, Sikh communities across the United States and across the globe, actually, in terms of opening up um, the Gurdwara spaces of worship and elsewhere to free luncheons, to lots of assistance to those in need. And you know, I wanted maybe I'll end with uh, just kind of asking for this final thought: um, What can we do now to support the Sikh community in Indianapolis um, during some of these difficult times? Jay. Okay. Well, <laughs> I was uh, I wasn't sure who you wanted to go first. So, so yeah. yeah, along the lines we talked about, I think raising the awareness further, working with the local communities and working with each other, uh, making people aware uh, of, of uh, what kind of good work Sikhs have done and uh, other Asian communities. Sikhs have been known to be a generous communi uh, community since the Sikhism inception about 500 years ago. So, and that's inculcated in our community to help out uh, in whatever way. And when we are ready to help, we, we do not differentiate among communities. We, we will, Sikhs would help whoever. More recently in the COVID uh, era, that's become very uh, clear, not only in India, but in other parts of the world, including here. So I would say continue that good work uh, of raising the awareness and working with the locals in trying to, to, to raise this profile. Awesome. And uh, Melissa, um, I was going to ask you to speak a little bit about your project, but you already did. Um, and I'm wondering, though, if you could just maybe close out by giving us the website, so the web link, so anyone who is tuning in tonight can check it out. Yes, but before I do, I just want to add one thing that I think we can do to help make Sikh and all Asian American communities safe is insist on political representation. So voting, of course, matters, but also making sure we have institutions at the local and state level that allow government officials to know what our community needs. 
So representation is really critical power. I think we, that's what we should be working towards is power and making sure our voices are heard. And so the website um, my team has is called virulenthate.org. On that website, you can see all of the incidents of anti-Asian racism that we found reported in news media between January 1st and December 31st, 2020. You can see our first report on anti-Asian racism, um, a series of story maps. We have other reports coming out as well on Asian American resistance to racism in news coverage. So we look forward to sharing that with you. Awesome, and we look forward to referencing it. And I will remind others also that um, the staff AAPI hate uh, .org site is still up and running and uh, Melissa is also part of that team or at least was at one point. And anyway, we have uh, run out of time. We're over time actually. And so I appreciate both of you for joining us this evening for the weekly Asian American Herald show. I'm Hamani Gupta Carlson and I've been speaking with Professor Melissa Borja of the University of Michigan and Professor Jay Baga of Ball State University. The Asian American Herald is a Facebook and YouTube based news media outlet dedicated to discussing topics and building community among Asian Americans. So please continue to send us your story ideas and look for a recording of this show on our Facebook page. Have a good evening and I'll see you all again next Thursday. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.